We can't see them? Okay. Hey, everybody. We are here with Steve Sawyer. Um, Steve's one of the most interesting guys that we have met when it comes to selling on Amazon. Uh, he's The majority of his sales are actually international. You can see Steve's. He's, this should be a fun one. Steve's a very live character. Nah. Always fun to talk to. And um, whenever we were, we're, we're considering expanding internationally, and the first person that we wanted to talk to was Steve. And Steve gave us some great advice, and we wanted to share that with you guys out, out there because international is a real thing. I mean, it's a real opportunity, and Steve can tell us a lot more about it. So, Steve, how's it going, man? I guess we need to do it. It's awesome, man. <laughs> can anybody send in a question or type in chat or something to make sure that they hear nah, nah. us? Hey, I got we can start with. It's so interesting that you – can you everybody hear me? Well, that's what I was trying to make sure. Uh, better? Yeah, yeah, we've got it. Okay, we're good. Better? Now you can hear me? No, uh, we could. I just was doing a sound test to make, make sure that people could hear All right. Cool. So, as I mentioned, we, when we, we're working to go international, and we wanted, to, we wanted to learn more about the process. So, we got Steve. He came up here. He was, ta he was telling us all kinds of awesome stuff about how to get product to, you know, at first it sounds like a nightmare to sign up for for VAT, and you, you, you start thinking about all these things, and it's like, oh, gosh, you know, it, it sounds like a daunting task. Steve came up, he explained everything to us, and it's it's really not as bad as, it, I mean, nowhere near as bad as you think it is. And getting product to getting product to Europe, not much different than getting product to uh, to Amazon in the U.S. So that, that Steve can tell you a lot about um, shipping, to, shipping to the U.K., and you know, plus he's excitable. He's excited, and and I, I think he's excited because it's a real opportunity. So, Steve, you want to tell them a little bit about what who you are if they don't already know you? And, sure. Uh, my name's Steve. Oh yeah. So my name is Steve Sawyer. I've been selling on Amazon since 2014 uh, as uh, FBA, and uh, we jumped overseas uh, er, later in that year, uh, mostly because I heard that. Uh, First of all, I heard there were value over there, but also I was concerned about suspension of accounts, and maybe that was a, a way to, to balance that risk, which is, wasn't 100% true. But nevertheless, we went over there and found uh, just an amazing amount of possibilities over in Europe. But uh, So we've been growing. Uh, that first year uh, in Europe, we did uh, over 200,000 in just nine weeks. And then we last year we did over 600,000. These are 1099 numbers from Amazon. So it's not like I'm making stuff up or whatever. They're real numbers. Um, and this year we're looking, for, we're, we're, we're on forecast and going for seven figures. So we're excited and we see the opportunity. In fact, so much so that we're shifting a good chunk. We want to be over half over there, if not closer to 75% of our business overseas because of the, the youth of the marketplace and how much we are on the developmental curve of that. So um, we started, I started out of my garage uh, that two years ago and now we're, we just expanded into about 4,000 square feet of warehouse and uh, got probably eight, nine guys working for me, 10. No. Yeah. And, uh, uh, I like it. I like having guys work for me, but the, the drawback behind it is, is I lose a lot of things. Like, I, I, I'm not over in Europe right now as much as in the last uh, six weeks, eight weeks, as much as Justin was. This is uh, Justin. Yeah. Justin's by purchasing. He's, uh, he's one of my guys that helps with uh, purchasing and uh, segmentation of that. So uh, you're on pace to do seven figures in Europe alone this year, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's awesome. We did what 2.2 million last year um, overall, both our U.S. and our U.K. or European. The U.K. is the lion's share of that. About 80 percent of our sales come from the U.K. Um, there are five markets in Europe. Um, the other five aren't as strong. Well, Germany's is strong, uh, but uh, it has a, it has a uh, it's uh, we don't ship directly into Germany at the moment, so we we find that our sales aren't as strong as they are in the UK. Oh, awesome! What is the uh, for for the people that are, are wanting to go over? You know, we have we have people that signed up for this webinar because you know that that means that they are generally interested in going and shipping to Europe. 
<laughs> Just uh, we got a bit. <laughs> uh, got some riff rap going in here. So uh, yeah. <laughs> perfect. That was great. So yeah. so yeah. Everybody asks me, should I be in Europe? I mean, I get I get hammered all the time, and uh, they go, Hey, I'm thinking about Europe. How do you get there? What do you need to do? And about a year and a half ago, I, I kind of came up with this formula where I said. Maybe you really need to be doing annual sales in the U.S. of about three hundred to five hundred thousand, really, um, to before you should consider going over to Europe. And there are a couple reasons behind that, but the big one was is the U.S. had enough low hanging fruit from a, from a monetary leverage that you should stay there because that's easier to harvest. Well, over the last six, seven, eight months, um, we're seeing fiercer competition here in the U.S., um, and we're also seeing the migration of Amazon's restrictions and the ability to move within the Amazon platform, for example, daily payouts versus two-week payouts. So in Europe, you still get daily payouts. How long is that going to last for? You know, the, Amazon is a metrics-driven company, so they're going to get to a certain metric where they feel that that is no longer a, a value add to the to the FBA or the person that's uh, selling, third-party seller on their marketplace. So they're going to reduce that, just like they did here in the U.S. The neat thing about we can watch what's going on over there, and we can extrapolate it back here to the U.S. at some time in the past. I mean, we could see Amazon just duplicating the model. And uh, I don't know, where was I going with that? So why did I recommend? So knowing that, all right, and the increase, we just said, wait a minute, and then all of a sudden we came, we're coming up, how, how, how much does it really cost to go to Europe? I mean, what are the real, so we, we sat down and we brainstormed and we hammered it, and we said, wait a minute, it's not that expensive to go to Europe. It really isn't. You need a couple key things doing in this couple key direct, you know, do a couple things in the right order and have a little bit of expertise at certain points along the way such as signing up for the VAT, you need a little expertise in that, and uh, it's, then it's not that complicated. It's a lot like starting a business here in the U.S. You've got to deal with the government. You've got to figure out your shipping. You've got to figure out your, your zoning. You've got to do this and that. But at the end of the day, you're in business, and it's easy. Clickety-clack. You know? cool. So that's, yeah. Whenever Steve, whenever Steve came up, um, we, we were talking to him about signing up for the VAT, and, you know, we, we don't like to do, I mean, we, we personally don't like to do that kind of stuff. It's not, and we'd rather pay for it. There are services, and Steve actually referred us to a service who handled all of our VAT stuff for us. No problem. It was super easy. I mean, it's, it, but you can do, it's not something that you couldn't do yourself. You, you can't you can absolutely do it yourself. Um, I, I thought that, I just wanted to break in with that because I think it's a really important point. There are definitely people that, I, that don't want to handle it like, like you know, we didn't. Um, no. But one of the most interesting things you told us, and this is this is what really got us. Uh, and when we, this was at the Scan Power Conference, you were uh, that we originally were talking about it. That you were you mentioned how many how many actual buyers versus the U.S. or how many people there are versus the U.S. that uh, that that shop in Europe. And it's like that's a that's a really really big market over there. Okay, you want to tell them about how what what the market looks like. Yeah, so the European Union is about, in itself, there's, a, there's outliers, but the, the European Union that looks almost uh, like us versus wealth and culture and that kind of stuff is about 750 million people compared to we're about 325. So there are twice as many people in our, you know, in our buying window over there. And so... There's a ton of ground to har you know, to plant and harvest over there. And the interesting thing we, we did with that, with the pop, you know, we looked at the population. You look at the population, you go, wow, they should be doing about the same, right? Well, here's the, we were just sitting down here, and we were goofing around while we were waiting for the webinar to start. And one of the things that we look at is BSR, best-selling rank. But when we're looking at the best-selling rank, we kind of stay, we look at what the 1%, the 2%, the 5% is, and it kind of gives us a feel where the sweet spot is, so to speak, that, that 2 to 
10% uh, top PSR. I don't like to drift too high into the high vault, you know, the high attention stuff because a lot of, a lot of, uh, not, not as, just doesn't work in our theory. But what we were doing is we were comparing the amount of items for sale in Amazon UK versus US. And we came up with some really interesting numbers. Justin's going to show us here. We just wrote them down. And if we look at here, and, and I always, I've been telling people, you can rest your eye on here, I think. There you go. We've been, we've been telling people is, you know, that market's a lot like Amazon used to be here about five or six years ago, where Amazon was all about books and all about toys. That was their first really kind of entry point, and then they kind of drifted into electronics. Well, all of a sudden, we can see here in the U.S., this is current numbers, there's almost, there's 500, 5,900,000 you know, about six million items for sale in the U.S. toys. Almost the same amount in the U.K. All right? So toys is very mature. established, mature. Absolutely. I see it. We see uh, two or three, four sellers on there. We see that kind of stuff. And then we go down to uh, uh, the books. We ran the numbers on the books, and the books are only, it's 60 million in each platform with a variance of 200,000. So both books and toys, no room. I mean, they're various, very, very equated markets, but all of a sudden we look at health and beauty. Um, is that number right? Yeah, in the US. It's a, US is three, no, it's 34 million. 34, right? Health and beauty in the US is 34 million versus, let me see here. We're supposed to blow blow these guys away with these numbers. No, they're they're when we looked at it, we were like, holy smokes, that was crazy. Health and beauty in the UK is yeah, 1.5 million versus versus uh, yeah versus five and a half million. That's a, that should be a five. So health and beauty is only one fourth as large as it is here in the US, and that's a pretty established place over there. Grocery, we've got over a million items here in grocery, and in the UK, only about 600,000. Home and kitchen, in the US, 65 million, only 22 million over there. And clothing, 35 million items here, 7 million over there. So you can see this really disparity between the marketplaces, and what that means is that there's holes, there's just complete offering holes in that marketplace, there is so much wealth that's not been discovered yet that you can find. And it's as easy as looking in the U.S. to find it. You know, so that we use that as a kind of the guide point. So, I don't know if that helped. The, um, but, but you actually said something in there really interesting. And this is, yeah. this is what really attracted us to it, too, is um, you, you said you'll go to those listings, the same number of, same, same number, same number of listings and toys, and you go to the listings over there. What's a typical seller count that that you see on four, on, a, on a toy listing? Four, maybe up to fifteen. Four to fifteen, maybe. Uh, maybe and FBA. Yeah, FBA maybe here two. Huh? Oh, typical listing here. 70. I don't know, seventy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean that's that that blows my mind. Like it is very so you're seeing you know the same number of products and, and toys are, are relatively close, but you're seeing a huge discrepancy in the amount of sellers that are on those products, and where there's less competition. I mean that's if you look at the Amazon flywheel, they want to bring on more competitors to drive down prices, right? That, that's that's Correct. the purpose of the flywheel, and that drives more customers. The same thing is uh, the, the same thing's happening there, except right now there's there you know the same the same products only have four sellers, ten sellers, and that's what we were looking at. It's like um, particularly I know Steve sources differently than we do. You know Steve does a lot more arbitrage, but for us when we were looking at it, it was like well I mean we have access to all of this product, and you, you know the European people aren't that much different than us. Like it, it's, it's in terms of what they buy. It's the same type of, of what there's the same type of wealth in the EU that there is here in the US. So it's, you know, generally the same type of products are in demand. And it's like, okay, so what are we going to do with this? 
We're, our goal is to get onto the UK and just have another place to ship our products to be able to sell them because there's a lack of competition. And a lack of competition means that prices generally stay higher. So, like, what, what are, what are t your typical margins there, Steve? T margins, I'd, I'd like to say that they're better than the U.S., but when we really run the margins, they're about the same as the U.S. There are 25 to 60, um, but we're, you know, there's a, there's a love-hate relationship with margins, right? Um, if you get, I always say that pigs get fat, hogs get slaughtered. There's a sweet spot where you, you could charge more, but your sales will decrease. You just naturally. So we stay where that, where that reasonable margin is, and that's where we find that nice velocity, you know, uh, rather than picking the top, because we're growing. We're, we want inertia, turns. We don't want inventory sitting in, you know, slower than it needs to. We're just trying to make sure that, that right, that's right. So. No, I mean, that's, that, that's, but that's awesome because you're, you're, that means you're maintaining those margins even after you get your product over there, which is one of the bigger hurdles whenever you start doing international. Um, so if I wanted to start, Selling today, and you've already told me this, and it's you know we're we've gotten our vat set up like we're we're well on our way to to getting to getting going. Um, but like if I wanted to set up and start selling in Europe, what steps would I need to take? Like, can you tell our our people like what do you yeah, need sure. to take off? The, the first step that everybody wants to race out and do is see if it's possible. So what they end up doing is they go over to Amazon.co.uk and they sign up. And that's the last thing you want to do because Amazon over there is a little different than we are. And so there's some nuances with that marketplace that you want to know before you start entering in your data and some rules that they have over there. And I don't mean to scare you. It's just not the first step that you, that you have. You've got some information that Amazon is going to ask for that you need to have. For example, you need to have a passport. It's the international ID. Without it, you can't do business internationally. I mean, I, I'm sure you can do a workaround with a bit with a with a birth certificate or something. But the truth is, is that that's the first step. The second step is, you know, you want to make sure that you line up all your government paperwork and you get your VAT number and you get all that processed. Then you want to make sure that you get your shipping and banking set up. The last thing you do once you get those items is open your UK account. Then you open up your UK account. But there's another thing you want to keep in mind when you open up your UK account is most people don't realize that your business address is public knowledge over in Europe. Meaning if you go to the Amazon.co.uk website and you drill down on a seller, okay, they will show your business address. So if you're operating out of your home or you're operating out of someplace that you don't want, you know, you, you have to assess how much information you want out there. Most, like most businesses for their mailing and outside appearance address, they have a PO box. And so that would be something I would want you to know because once you sign up and try to reverse back over, so now you sign up and I go back. The other thing that goes on is Amazon, because they're in Europe, Europe has some very strict identity, uh, banking ID laws they just recently passed. And so they, they're responsible for knowing who they don't do business with. And so what's important is that your, your paperwork that you submit to Amazon matches your other paperwork. So if you've got mismatched addresses or anything like that, they're going to drill down on those items. And you're going to have to be verified, get your verified. Now, where that comes into play is Amazon's got like a three-step verification process. The first one's to sign you up, and Amazon's very happy because you're on board. Second is get a little more information so you can send the product in. Amazon likes that because they got more product and they got listings and, and they're generating revenue. The last step is once you sell it to get paid. Well, because of the banking laws, Amazon sits on your money until you're, you're verified, which means and if you get caught in a verification loop with Amazon, it can be three months, four months until you see that money. And, and you're kind of in this, this holding pattern because they can't verify your ID and they're not as efficient if you enter it in right the first time, boom, 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 it's clickety-clack, it takes about 10 days. If you don't, verification loop. So that's the last step that I would recommend setting up. Did I answer a question? Yeah. Too much? No, I man, that was awesome. <laughs> I did, that's yeah. like one of those things. Um, 
Like that sounds scary, but it's really not. I mean, it's that's that's what you said. It's the same thing you told us. It's like, hey man, because get your get your account last. Just do all this other stuff. And uh, yeah, I mean, it was it was great advice. Like I, you don't know. That's the awesome thing. You don't intuitively know that kind of stuff. And that's something yeah. that could hang, you know, just hang your money up for two, three months. That'd be awful. Like it'd be awful if you'd sent any real amount of inventory in there. So yeah, oh, man, yeah. I'm sure people are. Yeah. yeah. Oh, go ahead. I'm sure. I'm sure the people on the on this uh, on this webinar are just like, wow, that was awesome because it's just something you don't know. Yeah, yeah, and and the other kind of the other thing about Europe is it's it's a little. Uh, undiscovered territory, which means you definitely, if you can have a guide, you'd like to have one, right? It's not that you can't do the walk. It's like driving to, if I wanted to drive to uh, New York, right? I'm going to pull out the map and have somebody guide me. And it doesn't mean that I don't know how to drive the car. It doesn't know, I mean, I, you know, can't. It just means that I got to have a guide that tells me what's coming up, how long it's going to take, what can I expect? Is that normal? You know, these are important things, and there is less information about going over there, especially from the U.S. to the U.K., that direction, for this kind of process, right? Um, we see some bigger concepts with private label, like, you know, buy, spend this, you know, this, and do private label over there, but not really U.S. to U.K., so. No, I mean, it's, a, it's definitely a... A newer concept, you know, it's obviously a newer concept because there's not very much competition over there. Um, and th th that information that you gave us was was, was invaluable. The uh, So, you know, as far as we're concerned, I, I know how we, you know, how we anticipate sourcing there. And we, we may deviate at some point, but we, we got a pretty good idea about how we want, how we want to work. But tell, tell people more about how you source there. And like, is it hard to find products? Is it, is it hard to find the things that, that sell well there? Uh, not at all. It, 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 what we really, the reason why, I, what I, the thing that I valued most, especially in retail arbitrage or online arbitrage, is it's scale, it, it's the small scale, right? Is, is this idea that you're in the store and you're using a scanning app, all right? And so you're buying the one item, right? You find a value, and that's really what our job is as arbitragers, is to find value, things that are undervalued, whether it's on clearance or there's a lot of them, or it, it's, it's a value, right? Well, the unfortunate part is here in the United States, that may be a value to, available to everybody, say target clearance, right? Well, if I could take that value that I know is too cheap for what it is and find someplace else where there's less competition and send it there, well, then I can make the money in the spread. And so the neat part is, is when, I, when we're retailing, retail arbitraging is we take our scanning app and, and you just scan it, boom, and then you just flip it to the UK market and see if it makes money over there. And so you, you, you're, you're maximizing your, your sourcing time. And so I would run with two shopping carts, one for US, one for UK, and just scan and boom, 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 boom. And so, you know, pretty simple. Um, so that's that's the neat. And then the other side of it is the more places I have to sell, Europe has five different marketplaces, and uh, it doesn't have just the UK. It's got Germany, it's got France, it's got Spain, it's got Italy. Those are where Amazon has actual marketplace websites and different fulfillment centers. Now, there's a whole process. There's different ways that you can deal with that. So again, that's just understanding the rules. But we, what we do is we ship, we ship into the UK and we deal with the UK government. Then we drop ship into the other four or any of the other European countries on UK laws. Pretty simple. But it, we can look at all five of those marketplaces. So something might not be selling that great in the UK, but it does really well in Spain. And we see some cultural nuances, especially in some toys and things like that, that really explode processes. So, hey, listen, I'll, I'll, we're going to go. I've been getting some questions come in, and we'll start kicking yeah. it off here in a little bit. But I, I did want to somebody had asked if uh, if there's any way that uh, you may be able to after this is over, uh, maybe post in the Facebook group something that that list or like step by step things that you said to to get set up before before you even hit. Uh, you know, setting up your seller account. 
if there's any way that we could get like that, uh, you know, presented in like a, maybe a to-do list or something like that, or just jot it down in a post somewhere, that would be great. Yeah, yeah. In fact, yeah, let's do that. Like a document, like a PDF thing. That's fine. Yeah. I mean, it can be, like I said, it can be as informal as a Facebook post or something like that. Somebody just asked and, uh, and I was like, I'm pretty sure Steve wouldn't mind to uh, put down that little checklist, no problem. And yeah, then actually, me a dance so put it together. Huh? Which scanning app, app do you use that switches back and forth? Well, we use Profit Bandit and because it's a fish, it's it's really slick. You just drop to the back side of Profit Bandit and you just toggle. And you can actually toggle between all the marketplaces. Like as long as you enter in your seller ID, you know, it's sign in basically. So you've got them all on the back of the Profit Bandit. Uh, Scan Power has a, a front toggle, but you got to exit out and exit back in again. Um, I, I like Scan Power's API access a little better in the U.S. because it's more robust. I, I get better information. But for speed and sourcing in Europe and back and forth, Profit Bandit right now. Awesome. So I actually run both. When I source, I run both of them. I run them both. So when I find a value with Profit Bandit, I double check on Scan Power. You know, it, it just it, it gives me more information. But I, you you mentioned the one one thing, and I, before we jump to the questions, I, I wanted to point out how impactful that was. Like, uh, and you talked about this at our conference, and, and people were people loved it. It was that whenever you're in a store, if you're not finding stuff that's good in the U.S., you're you're able to scan and find stuff that's awesome in Europe, and, and so it makes your store trips so much more robust. Like, you know, you never have dry runs, so to speak. Like, you're always able to find products that you're you're shipping. You're, you're able to sell somewhere. So I just think that's awesome and, and, and worth pointing out that it really does help your your ability to source products. Like, it makes you more efficient and, and makes you make more money. So um, you want to jump to the questions there? Yeah, you ready for some questions, Steve? Yeah, anytime. All right. Well, these came in uh, – You've, you've addressed or you know maybe like uh, talked about some of these things. In fact, this first one it says uh, Amazon UK account, their seller account. I'm assuming has been set up but not finished fat registration. Can I begin to sell? And I assume I mean I'm gonna let you you know answer that in depth. But I assume at this point, uh, according to you, they probably shouldn't even had a a UK seller account set up at this point. But now here they are. They've already set up to sell. Uh, haven't finished VAT. What should they do basically? Well, there's a there's a nuance in that marketplace, right? So you UK sellers don't have to have a VAT, right? A VAT up to a certain limit of selling. It's eighty two thousand pounds, but they, they they don't have to. And we as sellers can from outside the country can sneak in right now, and it's illegal. We're we're supposed to apply for the VAT, but because of that nuance. Um, all we need is an EORI number, okay? That's like an FEIN number, a, a social security card number for your company for over there. And you get that from the, the, the British government. But So you can ship product in on an EORI number without a VAT, okay? It doesn't work out the greatest, but the other, so you can get product in there. The problem is, is you're supposed to be charging VAT and the European Union is very, very um, aggressive right now. They've got some legislation in where they're talking about making Amazon responsible for your failure to pay back. And if that's the case, Amazon will hammer down into that. Now, I've never, I don't know if you can actually sell, well, I've seen it. I've seen it. I've run it into a competitive structure. I haven't talked to anybody personally that's gone from the supplier side. but. I've seen it in the competitor structure where they where sellers without a VAT have been able to sell. But they are incurring a liability. That and the British government can come in and they'll just like any other tax situation, they're gonna tax you. And then I I, I do what'll happen if Amazon gets hooked into the deal, they'll suspend your account. So it's not a place you want to go, just take care of it right away. Um, you've gotten the establishment of your Amazon to ask, answer the question specifically. You've established your Amazon account. Now they're turning around and they're asking you for your VAT number. So then with that, with so you got to get your VAT number. Now the VAT number actually saves you money because Amazon charges VAT 
on their fees to you. It's 20%. Well, you get that 20% back as soon as you give them a VAT number because now you're considered a, a business as opposed to a sole, sole seller. Jumped around a lot, but kind of fun. I think that was good. Um, do you know what kind of DHL account I should set up? Don't even know how to start the conversation with them. Is, so I guess is a DHL account necessary? And uh, if so, what account the type that should set up or what have you? Um, international accounts, both our experience with DHL and UPS. We haven't done anything with FedEx. Um, uh, their service isn't as strong here. Um, but DHL and UPS required, we call them up, we said we want to set up an international account. They physically have a, a, a rep come out and talk to you and, and they'll set up the account. And the reason why is because they need, they need to become your IOR, importer of record. They actually have a little bit of a power of attorney to pay the VAT and taxes for your for you. So this is a, a lot like a an application for credit. It's establishing a, a, an international account. So that's the first step. The next step is to understand what the tariff. You know, the companies have a set tariff rate. Rate. You're going to want to try to pile in on a discount, which is what everybody talks about when they say, "Oh, I got great rates. They gave me a special discount." All that is is they take the tariff, say it's uh, $100 to ship 100 pounds, and they say, well, we'll give you 70% off tariff. Well, now it only costs $30 to ship 100 pounds. So that's how uh, DHL or contracts, volume contracts are written with them. Okay. Of course, there's going to be a lot of questions about VAT um, through here. Yeah. But, uh, so this one is curious about taxes. Um, how do you figure out your VAT? And how do you how do you how do you pay your VAT? Um, do you have to have a, a UK agent in the UK to pay to pay the the VAT that is due? No, no. I mean, you got to pay in British pounds. Right. So one of the important, you know, we talked about what are the steps to getting there. Remember, we said establish your government, get your paperwork, your VAT, and your established account. What they don't have for you during that is just a place to send your money. Right? It's going to be a ABA number and blah blah blah, and then the other thing you got to set up is your shipping account. But the third step we talked about is banking. So you're definitely going to want some sort of way to repatriate your money back. Now Amazon graciously does this for you, right? They'll take your pounds and send it back to the U.S. and then all you have to do is wire transfer it to Britain again. There are, you know, some banking arrangements that allow you to establish a, a, a bank in Europe, I mean in Britain, so to speak, or in a European country like Germany for, for euros, and then you can pay the British government direct from that account. So you don't have the double translation of fees. By the way, Amazon, I think they're up to, they're somewhere between 4 and 5%, so that's really high. There's better values um, to, to deal with. I mean, we've got some contacts that, you know, that, that can do that. I mean, happy to, to show that to people or get it for people if they have a, if there's, and to, you know, rather than flood the screen with lots of information that maybe not, you know, that's time sensitive, have them just contact me and we'll talk about it. Do you pay VAT when it's imported or on the sale? Or like, when do you owe it? When do you owe the, the government? Uh, on the end? <laughs> so, so the VAT, the best way to explain the VAT is is uh, it's a lot like our sales tax in the fact that the end consumer pays a percentage of what it costs, right? But unlike our sales tax, the uh, it the it's called it's called an indirect tax, which means uh, excuse me, an incremental tax, which means each level of supply is taxed. Okay, so as there's no uh, tax exemption certificate like a sales tax, so Picture being able to buy product without a sales tax uh, certificate, and so you buy it from your supplier and you pay VAT tax. Then you go and sell it, and you owe the VAT, and then you collect the VAT tax, and then you get credit for the VAT tax that you paid on your supplies, and you you submit the difference, and that's why it's a VAT return, very similar to a sales tax return. Whereas if you were, there are some states that work that way. Rather, you know, that if you don't have a sales tax exemption certificate, you can apply a credit of a sales tax. So what happens is when you import, you're going to owe VAT. 
on the value of the item you're importing at its cost level. So let's say I'm taking a, a, a toy that costs $10, landed in, in England, and I owe 20% of that, so the, I'll pay the British government $2 for that. And for argument's sake, let's say it sells for $40. Let's, let's not do exchange. It sells for $40. Well, then I owe 20%. I owe $8 to the government, but I get the $2 credit, so I actually net owe the government $6. Okay, so that's incremental. It's also an indirect tax, which means it, it's, it's amazing how heavy it is when you see it from a supplier side of things. But an indirect tax means the end consumer pays it, but they're not aware of it. So the price is inclusive of the tax. So when you sell on Amazon, you can't opt out of that tax. It's considered, it's part of their TOS that it's considered included in the cost. So if you sell it for 40 bucks, the consumer is paying that eight dollars, or you know, eight dollars. Okay, uh, that makes Ooh. sense. Um, what products would you not send to the UK, and what restrictions are you aware of? UK is is pretty. Uh, Europe in general is pretty uh, global in its perspective. They do have. They're not a lot like Canada, where you have to have French speaking interpretation on the packaging. They, they're not as sensitive to that kind of stuff. But regulation-wise, the things that we know are meat and milk, okay, there's restrictions. It's not that you can't. There's just higher-level restrictions getting in. They have a different electrical system over there, so you've got electronics are, are, are questionable from that standpoint. Um, if you're uh, private labeling toys, they've got their own toy safety approval, but most of the toys here have been met those approvals. If you look in the back of the toy, it'll say, this and then CE for the European Union. Most of your commercial products are, are okay at that level. Um, but of course, I mean, if you are doing something, you want to know about it. So as you're, as you're dealing with product, you're going to want to drill down. There's no, you have to be responsible for what you're selling, so knowing it. But as a rule, they're pretty straightforward. In fact, the U.S. is the most litigious, I don't know if I use the right word, society in the U.S. When I'm dealing with insurance, when I say that I'm shipping from the U.S. to there, they're like, oh, that's, that's easier, right? It's, it's when I have to ship anything from the U.K. to the U.S., that becomes a greater burden from a, a, an insurance standpoint of a liability because of uh, how legally aggressive we are. So I hope I answered that question. No, you got it. You nailed it. Um, now selling products, uh, is are uh, categories gated similar to the United States, like which uh, – which ones require in gating that you know of, and how difficult uh, is it to to get ungated there, similar to the U.S.? So, uh, if we back up to Amazon, is wants sellers there? Amazon, is, Amazon goes through this cycle like this, where they're trying to they build up their seller, which drives more product, which drives more buyers, which drives more sellers, which drives more buyers, and so they do an oscillation. And right now they're in a, 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 a situation where they're trying to get more sellers over there. And you can tell because you're getting all these emails saying, come sell in Europe. Just sign up. So that's your responsibility. Um, so Amazon's aggressively, and they use the gating of categories, how easy it is to do them. They, the, the, you know, you, if you've ever been gate, ungated, you get the infinity loop here in the U.S. You don't get that as much over there. There's four, it's been a bit since I've been ungated, but the, the big ones are beauty, which is receipts, grocery, which is receipts, um, clothing, shoes, luggage, and watches are uh, listing, you know, uh, flat file based. And I think the other one is jewelry, which is receipt based. Um, other than that, oh no, flat file, flat file. Other than that, pretty much not. And, and, that, that process is not, other than the flat file and getting receipts, is not that horrendous. It's pretty easy. All right. Yes, they do. By the way, yes, they do. Star Wars is a, a you know, whatever they call it, special restriction. You mentioned your scanning app that you use for um, finding product. Uh, are there any other, you know, tools or software that you use specifically uh, for the U.K. or that maybe you use in .com and U.K.? Well, he, he, he's been, he works both sides right now, so 
Go ahead. Well, just for the guys that are uh, out there doing wholesale or if they're getting the um, the UPC or yeah, the UPC catalogs from wholesalers or from companies, or if you can come up with a list of them on your own, uh, we use the app Price Checker, Price Checker Two, I think it is. Um, it's similar to Evaluate on Scan Power, yeah. And so um, they actually have a component on there that runs it both uh, U.S. and U.K. Um, so you can get live results, um, and that shows everything from sales rank to a number of FBA sellers to what your ROI is going to be. Um, so we use that uh, um, to just submit a list and run it through the program, and the results show up. And it's interesting to see when you compare. Um, you pull up the U.S., and of course, 70% of the time, uh, it's not going to work because either the margin isn't there or there's a bunch of sellers, and then you flip over to the UK and you get seven, eight, nine, ten winners, and off you go. So that's definitely that's one that we use for sure. Uh, Jungle Scout works both uh, here and in the UK. Um, I think that's about it as far as apps and or extensions that we use um, or that work over there. I don't think the TWF beta works over there yet. You guys got to work on that. <laughs> Does the um, do you guys use any of the like listing softwares, like Inventory Inventory Lab, Scan Power, whatever? Yeah, we dropped off. We were Inventory Lab up until um, oh early last year when we went to multi stage. Uh, was it right going into fourth quarter last year when we started running multiple stations and Inventory Lab at the time was not. Uh, didn't have a solution at that time for that, but they're also they at that time they were not able to list in Europe, and I'm not even familiar if they are at this moment. In fact, I, it's on my list of things to do. Look and see if uh, uh, you know if they can inventory lab. But so we use Scan Power as a listing. Um, we like it because it allows us to do some things like use the M SKU, um, put the price in the M SKU, the the date purchased you know, that kind of stuff, uh, and map concerns, any of this kind of stuff, we can put it right there. It automatically programs into the uh, the merchant SKU. So but it, that's it the list in the UK? Huh? Uh, the scan power lists in the yeah. UK? Yeah, it lists in the UK. Okay. Yeah. You have to set up a separate account. If you can't use your U.S. account. You use a U.K. account. So you have to run two accounts. I don't know if they've globally attached them yet or not. All right. I believe I can fill the next one. Uh, do you need a UK bank account? I think you said that you don't. Is your that Amazon? It's more expensive, right, to have Amazon send it to your US bank account. But there are services when you start doing higher volumes to start saving percentage points by getting a UK account. Is that about right? Yeah, yeah. If you want to, you want to save money uh, in wire charges, or you know, I mean, uh, you know, get something closer to two percent. You know, you're better off. You know, figuring that banking solution out—it's—it's it's a, a lot, and you own it, and you get the money faster too. I mean, it's wired, you know, 24 hours, bam. You know, that's another thing is most people. I like talk about this. We're prepping product, and we ship it both to the U.S. and the U.K. Right? We prep it, it comes in, we prep it, goes out the same day, basically. Well, we put stuff on the truck to go to Europe at four o'clock, the same time the UPS guy picks up our packages to go to Philadelphia and. Texas and California, right? Well, my stuff, let's say it leaves here on a Wednesday at 4, it's for sale, checked in, and selling by Friday afternoon, 48 hours later. My stuff hasn't even been received in California yet. It's crazy. Wow. I mean, it's very quick. Yeah, it's 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 fast. That's insane. You know? now, yeah. uh, I know the U.S. fulfillment centers are getting just infamous now for uh, not being able to receive product in any reasonable amount of time. So that's another beautiful bonus there about swimming across the pond. Do um, you need to apply for VAT in each country, or does UK VAT cover uh, all country, all of Europe? I'm sorry. Yes and no. So this is where you get into that, that you're dealing with multiple countries over there, even though they have what they call um, free circulation of goods, which means goods can cross anywhere without any import uh, accountability at the transfer point, but those who are shipping it are supposed to keep track of it. So each country in Europe has a reciprocal agreement to balance that out, which means I can, sh I can be a UK company and I can ship a certain amount into Germany, 
and I can pay the UK government instead of Germany the VAT up to a certain amount. They're called distant selling thresholds. And the same reciprocation goes in with Germany. German companies can ship into the UK up to a, the same amount. Well, it's in euros and pounds, but it's, it, it, they can ship at it before they have to register. Once you cross that threshold, then you're required to register for the VAT and incur the cost of dealing with the VAT um, at that level. But the, the distance selling thresholds are in smaller countries, typically 35,000 euros from the UK's perspective and 100,000 euros from Germany, which is one of the large, which is a larger community. So distance selling thresholds, it, it, it sounds really crazy. It's really pretty simple. Okay. You know. Um, let's see here. Did, have you encountered any issues with food item supplements, um, other ingestibles, I suppose, because of the difference in U.S. and European laws? Let me preface first with, do you even sell anything uh, of that nature? And if so, do, have you ran into anything like that? Do you have any experience with that? We've just started looking at uh, the supplements and haven't run into any issues with it. There's quite a uh, best way to do is just go take a quick look at supplements and how Everybody, that, that was a first rush. We see a little more maturity in that marketplace because it's high value, easy to ship, you know. Um, it's got a lot of private label possibilities, all that kind of stuff. Again, we go with the litigious U.S. versus the U.K. Um, I haven't encountered or heard of any, but we don't have a ton of uh, experience in it yet. We stay mostly to... Uh, we like, like, one of the sections we like is this idea of zero rated VAT. There are certain categories of items that you don't have VAT on. Uh, the, the two biggest ones are food, okay, and everyday food, um, and children's clothing and shoes. So those don't have VAT on them. So, for example, uh, if you're shipping a common staple household item um, of food, there's no VAT on it. You know, my favorite always is Jello. I pick on Jello all the time. People go, "What do you mean?" I mean Jello. There's no vat on Jello. No je vat on oatmeal. No vat on cereal, except for puffed rice, I think. You know, it, it, but there's some nuances in that marketplace. Potato chips have vat. Corn chips do not. I don't know why, <laughs> but it's all pretty. I mean, other than and then you know, and then there's some nuances. But as you you tackle the product one at a time, it, it really you know, oh, yeah, no big deal. All right. Somebody wants to know that they thought that you had to have a VAT to get an EORI, and they said that their EORI is the same as their VAT number with GB and a few zeros added. Yes. The, I have never applied for an EORI number without applying for a VAT or encountered anybody who's tried that, so I don't know. Okay. Okay. But... You know, I'll put it on my question list to ask Aberdeen, which is where where um, the British government throws all us. They're called we're called non non something P Tex or something, which just means outside companies trading inside of Europe, inside of the UK. But my VAT number is the same as an EOR number. My EORI number has the same as my VAT with a GB and some zeros, absolutely. Okay. Um, do you know of any prep services that uh, will ship to the uh, .UK, and are the prep requirements the same or look roughly the same that you've encountered? Yeah, we see some, some standardization on the prep. Um, they're not lockstep. Um, for example, their liquid rules are different than our rules. Um, here in the U.S., you can only ship four ounces. There, you can ship one liter, okay, for FBA. So there are some subtle differences. Did we just seize up? Okay, I, you know, up there. I think you're fine. Okay, cool. Um, there are some differences. Um, it's minor differences, but same bagging, suffocation labels, that kind of stuff. Um, from that, was there another part to that question? Yeah, do you know of any prep services that are currently... Uh, <laughs> prepping items and shipping them over to, uh, to EU fulfillment centers? Unfortunately, no. I think there's a, a few steps. I mean, this is so young that if anybody is doing it, they're making a reasonable amount of money doing it right now. 
So, um, I, you know, somebody stepping up and doing it, I think it, it's, it's coming. It's a short time. Somebody figures out a couple extra steps of shipping and does it. You know. sure. Good question. Great question. What about liability and insurance? Got to have it. Okay. It's, yeah, I mean, we just renewed ours. It just, yeah. There's, yeah, I got like three, we got bids from three different companies. It's, you're just getting, you're just that. You have to, if you have liability insurance, if you read your liability insurance here in the U.S., all right, it doesn't. It doesn't. It, it doesn't cover outside the territory of the U.S. So you have to buy an additional extension or a policy that has that attached. So it's something to talk to your agent. And there's a couple different companies that offer it. The bigger ones. This is not something that's special. People ship overseas all the time. You know. Uh, let's see here. What categories do you uh, do you like in the U.K.? Well, I like I like I like food, zero rated food. Toys are a layup right now until it, I got a feeling it's gonna get crowded real fast. Um, because it's the lowest hanging fruit and it's what everybody knows. Um, we're seeing it get a little more crowded, so to speak. Um, what like eight sellers? Uh, huh? Yeah, like eight sellers. The problem is is remember we talked about that ebb and flow? Well, they're trying to there's 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 you know the demand in there's not as many people buying yet in the e-commerce. We talked about that 750 million people, and then we talked about how many few things are offered, right? Those Amazon Prime is not as strong. It's kind of like 2009, where Amazon Prime, they were just, well, they just came out then, but they're really trying to get traction on it. So there's a lot more merchant fulfilling going on over there. A lot of, uh, a lot of established vendors that have commitments to, to fulfillment houses. Um, think uh, Target or Sears, but not, I mean, the, even smaller guys have been fulfilling for years. And so they're on Amazon, but they're merchant fulfilling. Amazon, we know what that model happens. In fact, just the, about two weeks ago, I was on a Facebook group, and I, I'm on the UK Facebook groups, and some guy was not very positive about FBA because he didn't understand why he's been merchant fulfilling for years on Amazon and gave them lots of money, and why the FBA guy gets the buy box even when he's 10 cents more expensive. He didn't understand that, and when I see that, it just warms my heart because I'm an FBA seller. That means that that marketplace is identifying FBA, it's seeing prime, and it's having an effect on sales, which are positive for me as an FBA seller. Uh, due to, obviously, uh, freight costs could be high. Is there any type of weight restriction or limit you put on per product um, when sourcing? If it makes money, sell it. Right. Just do the calculation. People get all twisted up about shipping. It's expensive. I got news for people. You pay for shipping in your product every day. When you go to Walmart and you buy that product that came from China, all right, there's shipping in that in that that cost. Walmart didn't negotiate free shipping for you. I mean, it, there was shipping in that, and it's rolled into the cost and a cost, the cost of goods sold. So I never look at shipping as an expensive component. What I look at when I look at something making money in Europe, I look at its landed cost. What's it going to cost me landed, and can it make me money? What it costs me to get it there is important only in that calculation. You know, it's a, yeah, but because we, it's a lot like the VAT tax, right? Because I can recognize it and it's a separate attachment, right? Then I worry about it because it, I, I don't want to pay it, right? But the truth is, is we're always paying it. Did that help? No, no, that's, uh, yeah, that, that makes complete sense. Um, uh, that's probably... <laughs> Like, when I get my DHL bill and it's thirty thousand dollars for thirty days, it's still a <laughs> it's still a lot of money. Oh no doubt, yeah. That's uh, so. I mean, I, I want to thank you for for these questions. Uh, uh, you know, these people obviously it's, are very hungry and, and, and wanting to know about this stuff. But I did want to mention things, uh, a couple of things before we uh, wrap up here. I'd ask about the fulfillment. You obviously said that would be, uh, you know, next level for anybody. So apparently, uh, John Bullard's prep company is currently doing it, and Barry and Treebear both. They both. Uh, he said he was getting ready to start it. So apparently, Suzanne had asked that question. So apparently, there's some people in the game now, and, and, and Barry. Perfect. 
to be doing it. So that should make it, you know, open it up even more. And uh, so, like I said, I want to thank you for your time. And I know that uh, you're going to put out a, uh, some information pretty soon for, for our people, right? Is it, is it like a Sunday? You've got some, some good information to, to help people get going. Is that, is that, is that right? Yeah, you know, I, I get asked, you know, I go to a conference, I go here, I get asked it a lot, so I've rolled kind of the, the questions that I got the most, it, it come to me the most, and got a bit, we're, we're going to release a little video that kind of helps people start with answering those questions, really, and kind of put it in that format, um, so. Um, no, that's great. I, help out. We get yeah. the same questions over and over, so it's good that you're going to have that, because people are going to have a lot of those. <laughs> question because everybody's at the same level really with this i mean it's so new it's so yeah. exciting uh and such a new marketplace that you know the questions are going to be repetitive and basic so i definitely understand that and uh so we, we appreciate it in advance for that because i know it's going to be quality uh quality stuff and uh you know like i said we want to thank you for you know for taking the time to to answer these questions that you've uh been very forthcoming and, and very uh uh you know personal as always which i never <laughs> I didn't expect your personality not to shine through, so I knew that would be a, a big hit. So, you got anything you want to? I am knowledgeable. I mean, you, right. you you know a lot about the stuff, and it's uh, it's definitely a big help to us. And I, I know uh, you know, I know this video is 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 going to be a big help to everybody who watches it. Like they will learn so much. And uh, I want to remind you about the. Yeah, we'll get that checklist from you, or the uh, yeah. just make a post in our group or something. Yeah. Sunday video. That's what yep. we should do. That'll work. Yeah, just there fire it out there. Um, that's awesome. But yeah, it was fantastic having you on, Steve. You're, you know, you, you blow me away every time I talk to you. Uh, before we go, can you tell us one reason, like the one primary reason people should consider selling on the UK or, or selling in, in Europe? It's one reason. Just if one. you're selling, one reason. If you're selling FBA, all right. You're selling FBA. It doesn't matter if it's in the U.S. or Europe. What difference does it make? You're selling. You're in business. Be in business. Right. Sell more products. Yeah, sell more product. Well, that's the goal, isn't it? It's been great chatting with you. I know everybody's enjoyed it. I'm getting a lot of good feedback here in the questions. Uh, I would wish you a happy Memorial Day, but you're doing so much in the U.K. I'm not even sure you celebrate U.S. holidays anymore. But uh, <laughs> so we're gonna. <laughs> it's so true. <laughs> My guys are like, "Do we work Monday?" I'm like. All right. No, you don't have to work. <laughs> anyway, it's been great. and really hope you guys have a, uh, have a great weekend. Thanks, guys. All right. See you, See you Steve. Steve. Yeah.